We are Plum Creek Church, and we are a place where you matter. Our mission here is centered around change lives, changing lives. We believe this happens through three important relationships, intimacy with God, intentionality with family, and influence with others. God has something he wants to say specifically to you wherever you are. Our hope is that you leave encouraged and closer to him than ever before. We'd love to connect with you online at plumcreek.church or on social media to see how Plum Creek is impacting our community and what opportunities we have for you and your family to get connected. If you'd like to support the ministry we're doing here in Castle Rock, two easiest ways are through the Give tab on our website or via your mobile device by texting any dollar amount to 720-606-5563. It's a secure connection with simple instructions to get set up. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope you'll enjoy this message. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my to love
somebody a high five, give somebody a fist bump, then grab a seat. Well, welcome. Welcome to Plum Creek Church. So good to see all of you today. If you're joining us online, welcome. We're so glad that you're joining us there from your home or wherever you are. For everybody in this room, if you did not know this, you can join us on Saturdays at 4.30 p.m., Sundays at, what time is it? 10 o'clock. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, we're streaming the full Plum Creek experience. At those times, you can join us, plumcreek.live. We are so glad that you're here. Thanks so much for spending part of your weekend with us. If you are a guest today, um, an extra special welcome to you. Man, we know there's lots of great churches here in Castle Rock, so for you to spend some time with us uh, is truly meaningful, and we're so glad you're here. If you are new, uh, there's two things we wanna talk about. One is what we're all about here at Plum Creek, and that's change lives, changing lives. And what that means is that the work that God has done in us is not only for us, and that once we've experienced that life change, we have a responsibility, we have an opportunity to help others experience that change as well. And then the second thing, if you're new, is this Next Steps card. This is something we'd love for you to fill out over the next hour. Um, just let us know that you were here. This is an easy way to uh, get connected here at Plum Creek. Nothing's gonna, nothing strange is gonna happen. Just someone's gonna call you from our team, ask you a couple questions, and that's about it. But we, again, we are so, so glad you're here. One thing that we do every weekend and we're gonna have an opportunity to do today is to give together. Um, we believe that God should come first in every area of our lives and that certainly includes our finances. And so if you have questions about how you give, there's an envelope in the seat back pocket in front of you, four easy ways to give. You can give via text, you can give online. If you came prepared today to give, uh, you can use those envelopes to put cash or check in there. And then we're doing it a little differently now. Uh, there's gonna be ushers at the doors at the end of the service. And so we're not gonna pass the buckets, but at the end of the service as you leave, you can drop those next steps cards, you can drop your giving en envelopes there. Uh, one thing uh, I wanna talk about today is uh, this is our second weekend of new service times. And so thank all of you for being flexible, kind of rearranging your schedules to accommodate this new service schedule. But with change comes opportunity. And uh, there's some opportunity right now for you to get further connected and plugged in here through serving. And one of the ways we wanna highlight serving this weekend is on our parking team. Uh, that's an incredible team. They're first impressions of our church when new people come onto our parking lot. And we need some people to sign up to, uh, to help with that team. You get to be outside, you get to hang out with a great group of people. And so after the service today, outside there's some, some people in yellow vests, you can't miss them. Go ask them, they've got the, all the details about schedule and commitment and all that, but we would definitely encourage you to do that. And the bottom line with that is, uh, whether it's parking or whether it's children's ministry or whether it's tech media, everybody has, has gifts. Everybody is called to serve in the local church. And so we wanna see that happen. We wanna be a culture, a church culture of people who serve and give back in the local church. And so if, if you're not connected and plugged in and serving, use this card, Send us, give us your information. There's a little box you can check that says serve. Fill that out, drop it in the buckets as you leave today and uh, someone will be in touch with you this week. Again, so grateful that you're here. Would you guys stand with me again? We're gonna continue our worship today. Well, church, we serve an unstoppable God. Do you believe that? Come on, he's good, amen? Come on, we're gonna continue to worship. Let's sing this out together.
on, do you believe that nothing will be impossible for our God? Come on, if you believe that this morning, let's sing this out together. Sing, nothing shall be. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise for
Aren't you thankful that he's the way, the truth, the life this morning? And we have hope in him. The Bible says he came to give us life and life to the fullest. And in fact, he came to give his life as a sacrifice for our sin. And this morning, we're gonna take a moment in our worship to pause and take communion together. The ushers are gonna come forward at this time. We practice open communion here at Plum Creek, which means you don't have to be a member. In fact, we don't even have a membership. You don't have to be a regular attender. We just ask that you have a personal relationship with Jesus this morning, that you declare that he's your savior. And it was the night before Jesus went to be crucified. And he gathered all the disciples around and he took some bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body that was broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. And after that, he took the cup. He took the wine and he said, this wine represents my blood. My blood that was poured out, my blood that was shed for you, for your sin. Drink this in remembrance of me. Whatever you're going through today, whatever you're facing, maybe you're far from God today, I want to invite you just to pause and remember the salvation that we have through Jesus and what he did on the cross. I think there's something that happens when we just take a moment and reflect on that. It brings me to a deeper place of, of praise and adoration. We're going to practice self-led communion, which means just take a moment, reflect, pray. And when you feel ready, partake of the emblems. And then we're just going to worship louder than ever for what our Savior has done for us. Let's worship.
give it all. Praise God. There's power in the name of Jesus. Jesus, we thank you for all you did for us. For the price you paid on the cross. That your body was broken. That your blood was poured out for us. Just like that last song said, our sin was great, but your love was great. Your love was great. We thank you. We thank you for that today. But death couldn't hold you. Death could not hold you. And you are risen, you're alive, and we stand alive in you in this place today. And it's by your grace that we stand. God, I pray that everyone would realize that in this place this morning. And how worthy you are. How worthy you are of it all. Of all praise, of all glory, of all honor. And here and now, we come to give it to you. May it be pleasing. May it bring, bring joy to your heart. Be magnified. Be glorified. Jesus, we love you. We praise you today. And it's in your name. Amen. Amen. Aren't you thankful for the salvation we have in our Savior today? Come on. Yeah. He's worth Oh, we pray. Well, hey, it is so good to see you all here. And I want to tell you, it's so awesome just to be in this place as a church, as a body of believers, to lift up the name of Jesus. And I want to just encourage you, when you come, just to come expectant to do that. He's the reason that we're here. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, it's so good to see you all here. Thanks for worshiping. Thanks for singing. At this time, please grab a seat. Good morning, 10 o'clock. How are you? Everybody doing good? Can you help me? Uh, just extend a greeting to those that are, uh, say, are, are joining us on our live stream this morning during the service. Want to say hi to you guys. Can we uh, thank those for, that are watching? Thank you for doing that. We are in uh, week three of a series that we've titled Gear Up. If you have your Bibles or your smartphones, please turn to Ephesians chapter six. Ephesians chapter six, a really powerful uh, several verses that we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks and will continue as we unpack this passage of scripture that details uh, what we call the armor of God. So we're going to be talking about that some more today. Um, in week one of this series, Tommy read a quote, and we're going to read it every single uh, week during this series because it's critically important for us to remember. This was the quote, the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world that he didn't exist. Why would that be the greatest trick of all time? Well, let me remind you, he has a very specific purpose. The purpose is detailed for us in John. John chapter 10, verse 10, and it says this, that his objective, his purpose, is to steal, to kill, and destroy. And it seems to me that if that is your objective, the best way to do it would be to come in and do it very underhandedly, cause us to not even be aware of this battle that rages around us, seems like you'd be able to do your job. And I know that is his purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. I've experienced it in my life, 
and you probably have as well. So the Apostle Paul wanted his church in Ephesus to understand the battle that we're talking about today, and I want our church to understand it too. So we're going to start today in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Paul was writing, and he said this, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So in review, let me just remind you, there's a spiritual battle that rages around you. It is reality. Scripture's very clear in telling us that. Your enemy is a liar. That's his number one tactic, and he's going to come after us with half-truths and things close to truth that are so deceptive, if we're not prepared and ready, we won't be able to discern that they really are lies. And the intent of those is to get us so far off course that ultimately he will, he will steal, he will kill, and he will destroy so we gear up. How do we do that? The Apostle Paul used this metaphor that would have been very common and very uh, understood in the culture that he was speaking to in Ephesus in the first century. This is a, a Roman city, one of the top five largest, about a quarter of a million people live there, and they would have seen the military personnel everywhere like you would in the, the Roman Empire, and they would also have been very familiar with the gear that these soldiers would wear. Paul describes this armor in Ephesians 6 and paints this word picture, a comparison between what the soldiers were wearing and what we need to wear in the spiritual battle that we're fighting. We need to remember that this is God's army and he's given it to us. So how do we, how do we gear up and fight properly the spiritual battle that is in our lives? Here's the answer. Look at verse 13. Therefore, Paul says, put on Every piece, and I want to stop there, and I just want to remind you that it's important that we come fully dressed and ready for battle. We don't just wear one piece or two pieces or choose our favorite. We gear up properly. If you're going to go to war, you want to go into that war ready. And so he says, put on every piece. And then again, I want to remind you, every piece of, and look at the words there, God's armor. This isn't your armor this is not something that we make up ourselves. It's our Heavenly Father that looks at you, me, you and me and says this, I love you. I care about you. So much so that I'm going to do the very best that I can to equip you for this battle that rages around you. And I'm not gonna give you any armor. I'm gonna give you my armor. Now you have a responsibility to take that armor and to put it on. Seems like if we're gonna fight smart, we would do this. And then he tells us what happens. If we will put on every piece of God's armor, you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. I love this next sentence. Then, after the battle, you will still be standing firm. So he says, stand your ground, and then he's gonna tell us how to do this. Putting on the belt of truth. Remember, we talked about this last week. Support the core, like someone doing heavy lifting in the gym. Support the core. What do we support the core of who we are with? The truth. So we go to the one who is truth, that tells truth, so that we can understand truth and discern the enemy's lies. We support our core with the belt of truth. And then he continues, and last week we talked about this as well. He said as well, we also put on the body armor of God's righteousness. Pastor Stephen let me use his body armor. <clears throat> He's a chaplain for the police department. <clears throat> I want to remind you how important this body armor is. But I also want to remind you whose it is. See, in Scripture it doesn't say that we put on the body armor that is our righteousness, right? If this thing was Doug's righteousness instead of God's, it'd have holes all over it. Because I'm full, I'm a mess. Imperfect in pursuit of a perfect God. So we put on instead the body armor that is God's righteousness, not ours. 
That's beautiful because in that comes protection for our heart when the enemy comes and tells you that you're not good enough, that you can't be forgiven, that you've fallen too far, that he would never love or use someone like you. You stand with your body armor of his righteousness and say, I discern that to be a lie. And you're right, my righteousness holes all over it. But in your righteousness, God's righteousness, I stand heart protected because of what he's done, not because of what I've done. So we put on the body armor of God's righteousness. This is powerful stuff, but we're just getting started. We have to gear up all the way. And remember as well, this armor is available for you every single day, all throughout the day. But you and I have a challenge to be reminded to put it on, to make sure that we're not going to fight this battle unprepared and vulnerable. Instead, we consciously and on purpose choose to gear up. And this week, we're gonna take a look at the next two pieces, and this one makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> In verse 15, Paul continues and says, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news, so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, he continues and he says, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. So here's my main thought for this weekend. You can write it down. Put on gospel peace, and faith. Put on gospel peace and faith. Let me just give you a little history lesson on those Roman soldiers. One of the most important pieces that they would wear when they would go to battle were their shoes. And they were very special shoes, different than the rest of the culture. They were crafted very carefully to help them to be prepared and ready to fight. As a matter of fact, the leather or the sole on the bottom of their um, of their feet was almost three quarters of an inch thick of leather. But what I also found interesting, as I took a look at this a little bit closer, they were actually studded or cleated sandals that they would wear so that they were able to dig in whatever the ground might look like and be sure-footed. Interesting to me that we need to be sure-footed in our battle that we fight against the enemy as well. And if you remember or have seen any movies related to the, to the um, Roman military, what they, they were known for the way that they would keep rank. They would, they would hold together in a tight formation, and these shoes were a big part of that, so that they could stand their ground. And this was one of the things that created the strength of the Roman army that they would be able to stay in formation tightly together, sure-footed and able to climb or move towards their enemy. The shoes were essential to fighting. Imagine a soldier clad in armor from head to foot, but no shoes. Think about that. When you go out into the field, the rough ground could tear and bruise your feet, and even the toughest of warriors could be rendered useless if their feet were beat up. And perhaps you're military trained and you're here today, you would know that this is true in your training as well. You are taught to take care of your feet, to make sure your socks and your shoes are right, your boots are ready, that they fit well. Because if you have feet that are ripped up, torn up, blistered, and, and unable to provide the stability that you need, you're vulnerable. And so we want to make sure that we are properly fit with these shoes. So I was thinking about this this week. I was thinking about shoes. I'm gonna pull a Mr. Rogers today. I think my son Zach and his roommate Ryan are watching in college today down in Arizona. They're the ones that helped me pick out these new shoes. Do you like getting a new pair of shoes? That feels pretty good, doesn't it? By the way, if you haven't seen the Mr. Rogers movie, you're missing out. It was pretty good. But I love getting new shoes. We have all kinds of shoes in our culture today, don't we? We got dressy shoes and casual shoes. We got work shoes, we got boots. We got sandals, we have slippers. We have athletic shoes that have cleats on them like the ones we're talking about today. And uh, do you remember what it was like when you were a kid and you got a new pair of shoes? Do you remember how good that felt? It changes everything, doesn't it? You know what I used to think when I got a new pair of shoes when I was a kid? I used to think I was more of the deal. I used to think I could run quite a bit faster. I thought I could jump a little bit higher. I was pretty sure those shoes were gonna help me get to the league. 
There's just something about a new pair of shoes that when you're proud of them and, and you put them on, you just feel a little better. And you can remember when you would begin a new season, if you ever played a sport and you got a new pair of shoes, you're like, man, check me out. This is the year. I am the real, you see, you see the new shoes, right? See them? There's just something about a new pair of shoes. And what I've been praying this week is this. Before you leave today, you would be inspired with the thought that part of what our Heavenly Father has given us is a new pair of shoes. And these shoes give us a different kind of confidence when we stand, and it gives us a new kind of preparation when the enemy comes our way. So I need you to understand that God has given you a new pair of enemy-fighting shoes of peace. And that's a beautiful thing. You see, we have to put on this special pair of spiritual fighting shoes, not any shoes, peace shoes, that are birthed and inspired and flow from the message of the gospel. Because look, look at me, the gospel changes us. It changes us. It gives us a new kind of confidence. It helps us stand when the enemy comes and attack. The gospel changes us and man, that sounds good when we talk about the gospel that brings peace, peace. That's a pretty elusive word in our culture today. If you were asking me in general terms to describe the culture that you and I live in, pretty sure I wouldn't use the word peaceful. There are other words I would use. And here's the part that hurts a little bit. Even in describing those of us that are Christ followers, I'm not sure I would use the word peaceful. Busy, distracted, stressed, spun up, conflicted, worrisome, anxious, fearful. Those are words I might use. Peace. Don't you wish you had more peace? What's interesting to me is that Paul said, the shoes, the shoes of peace make you stable and help you to stand firm, ready to be able to fight the enemy. Let me help you understand this peace just a little bit more. Because Paul says we need to, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news. He's talking about peace in your heart, confidence, like when you got that new pair of shoes when you were a kid, convinced you could run a little faster. But it's a different kind of peace. It's, this confidence rises up from a heart that's changed by the gospel, makes you ready to fight the enemy. Does that sound contradictory to you? Peaceful, ready to fight. Peaceful, confident in the war. I was thinking about that this week, and it kind of does make sense to me, because the best soldier is the one who's at peace with the mission that they're fighting for. The best warrior is one that believes in the fight that he or she is fighting, and that it is a just cause. A warrior that trusts implicitly and has peace related to their commander. Someone that knows that he or she is well equipped and ready for battle and believes, believes that victory is theirs. This is precisely the peace that we have as we prepare to go to battle with our enemy. Because you know, the gospel changes us. The gospel, the good news, it changes us. That's why we're here today. Because we've been changed by the gospel. What does that even mean? That means that your life becomes a completely different story. It's totally different. It was a transition from chaos to peace. It was a transition from hostility to love. It was a transition from being riddled with sin to now forgiven. From being uh, full of death to now full of life. From being defeated to now being victorious. Those are some shoes. 
That changes the way you look at things. It changes the way you walk into this battle with your enemy with a different kind of confidence. God's peace has several dimensions, and I want to read these to you, and if you have your pen out, you might want to take some notes. The first piece or dimension of God's peace is this, peace with God. Peace with God. Think about that for a second. Peace with God. Romans 5.1 says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Just, that's mind-blowing, That you and I have an opportunity because of the good news, because of the gospel, because of God's love for us that he would send his son, that now we can be at peace. Our soul can be at peace and at rest in our relationship with him. That's good news. It changes us. But it doesn't stop there. We also have an inner peace. Boy, that's something that I want and I want you to have too. Listen to what Paul said in Philippians 4, verse 6. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done. Look at verse 7. This is awesome. Then you will experience God's peace. You will experience his peace, not something that you've manufactured, not something that you've tried to work up in your own heart. It's his peace. And look at, look at, this describes this peace a little bit more. This peace which exceeds anything we can understand. Boom, it blows your mind. You're in the middle of chaos, the enemy is attacking, and you stand confident in peace. It doesn't make sense. It's mind-blowing, inner peace. I want that, and I know you do too. But it doesn't stop there because the gospel is so thorough in changing us. The good news changes everything that it also changes our relationships, and we have relational peace. Colossians 3, 14 and 15 says this, Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Look at this. Again, look at verse 15. And let the peace, what peace? The peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. See how thorough the gospel is. See how thorough the good news is. See how sweet These shoes are that he's given you. Peace that impacts the way that we relate to each other. Oh, but it doesn't stop there. Another part of this is an eternal peace. Oh, this is good. 2 Corinthians 4.18. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. It's an eternal perspective. Hey, by the way, regardless of how much the battle rages, can I remind you of something? The worst thing that can happen to those of us that have embraced the message of the gospel and made it ours is that we die and go to heaven for eternity. Can you please remember that? That that sweet shoes right there. That helps you know that, man, the worst thing that can happen is my eternity is a peaceful one with the creator of the universe. And eternity, long time. That's good news. And it gives us peace. It gives us peace in the middle of the battle. So in practical terms, here's how it works. The attacks start coming your way. He starts trying to spin truth, tell you lies, get your head spinning in ways that it shouldn't. But you stand prepared, core supported with the belt of truth. You know truth. Now you can discern when the enemy is lying to you. And when he comes to you and he says things like, you're no good, you're not worth it, God can't forgive you, you got body body armor there, baby. That's protecting my heart. You can't take me down and out that way because I stand confident now in a different kind of way because I have his righteousness. His righteousness is now mine. My righteousness holds all over it. His righteousness, solid, protected, heart secure, and out of that, look what happens when you truly have the belt of truth and you have the breastplate, the body armor of his righteousness, all of a sudden, what flows to your feet? Sweet shoes of peace. 
peace. I'm at peace in my heart and my soul because of how he has protected me. The shoes of peace that come from good news. But remember, he said this. Don't just do one or two pieces. You got to do it all. So then he takes it to the next level in verse 16, and he says this. In addition to all of these, the belt, the body armor, and the sweet shoes, he says, now you're going to take up the shield of what? Faith. The shield of faith. And what does the shield of faith do? It stops the fiery arrows of the devil. Remember, put on gospel peace and faith. It's not a matter of if, but when. The darts, friends, are coming. The arrows will be shot. You are his target. They're coming your way. And you know what's so interesting to me? Think about a a military man or woman going into war, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, why are we fighting? That would be ridiculous. Because you've trained for, geared up for, and are ready for battle. That's what you do when you're a warrior. So why should we stand surprised when the enemy attacks? Isn't that crazy? There's a target on you. He's got the file with your name on it. He wants to take you down. He's coming. So don't be surprised. Peter says this way. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. You're wasting your time with this thought. What have I done to deserve this? Stop. It's a battle. Stop thinking that way. The time you see that as an alarm, the second you think, what have I done to deserve this attack? You just remember, you're in a war. So what do I do? I put my belt of truth on. I protect my heart with his righteousness, not mine. And I'm ready to dance with my new peaceful shoes. And then I grab my shield of faith. You pick up your shield. I've got a shield here today. This is a replica, but it's a bad one. It's a bad replica. Let me tell you why. Theirs were two and a half feet wide, four feet tall. This is a mini shield compared to the Roman ones, but it was the best I could do on short notice with Amazon. (laughs) But let me explain to you, this was a really important part of the Romans' uh, gear. They would not go to battle without their shield, and it was one of the many things that made them a formidable a military that could hardly be beaten. Because remember, I told you they would stay together in close formation. And those shields will literally be butt side to side, forming a wall in front of their formation as they march towards the enemy. And then when they would get close enough for hand-to-hand combat, they would just, in a very elusive way, be able to come out from behind their shield and stick their opponents and their, and their enemies with their knives and their daggers almost couldn't even get to them because of their shields. Therefore, can you imagine for a second being a Roman soldier going to battle with just your shield by yourself? That's a pretty miserable wall. But if you can stay in tight formation, church, listen to me, standing side to side, ready to fight as we should as Christ followers. So let me pause for a second and challenge you that if you're not in authentic relationship with other people that are in pursuit of this amazing God that we serve, standing shoulder to shoulder, accountable and fighting together, you are making a mistake and you are vulnerable to the enemy. Why? Because from a long ways off, he's shooting fiery darts at us. So what do we do? Just like the Roman army did, this was the way that they tried to defeat the formations that the Roman military would have. From a long way off, they would start throwing javelins and spears and trying to shoot arrows at them. So what they would do is form this wall in another whole kind of formation. The front line, put their shield down um, side to side. The next one behind them would put the front of their shield right on the top of the other ones. And they would form a literal wall of protection around themselves so that they were covered on the sides, in the front, and on the top. And you know what happens to those fiery darts and and javelins that are being thrown? They bounce off. That formation was called the turtle. True story. So guys, listen, when Paul says to us that we need to take up the shield of faith, he's not messing around here. The devil's fiery arrows are coming. And what I've found 
is that they look one of two ways in my life. This is what I've seen. They have two characteristics. The first one is that, and I said this last week, alluded to it just a little bit, they seem to arise out of our own thoughts from inside of ourselves. Remember last week I told you sometimes those thoughts come and you're like, ah, where did that thought come from? You've had that happen. You know what that is? It's a fiery arrow from the devil trying to get your head wrong, trying to get you to think something's truth that's not. Those thoughts come from the inside, and we're often shocked and horrified. How could we think those thoughts? That's the enemy playing his game. He's coming after you, and he knows what lies you are most susceptible to. And the next characteristic of the devil's attack is this, doubts, doubts. And they always come as an attack upon typically our position in Christ. And so that's why we stand protected with the belt of truth, calling lies, lies, having our heart protected with his righteousness, not ours, making sure that the peace of God is what grounds us. And then we deflect the enemy's fiery uh, arrows that are coming our way with the shield of faith. Now let me ask you this real quick. Look at me. What is, what is our faith in? Is it in ourselves? Is that your shield? I will hold up the shield of my own faith. Faith in who? Me. You better watch out. That thing is weak. <laughs> Instead, we hold up the shield of faith in the one who is faithful. The one who has been and will be faithful. You see how all of a sudden I got a different kind of confidence. You shoot your arrow, bring it. Faithful. Not me, by the way, it's him. Has been, will be faithful. That's who he is. And what is faith? What is faith? The Hebrew writer said this, faith, listen, is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Here's your assignment this week, two of them. I want you to grab a three by five card and in some kind of creative way, if you're artistic, I want to see a picture of it. And if not, I still do. <laughs> I want you to literally write on two different cards two different times when you know that God has been faithful. I want you to write it down. And I want you to put it in the corner of the windshield of your car or on your mirror or somewhere where you'll see it often. Because every day, listen to me, I want you to grab your shield of faith. And I want you to be reminded that he has been faithful in the past because it's so easy in the middle of the war to forget. And then I want you, when you see it and you're reminded to pray, Lord, help me to stand guard with my shield of faith in the one who has been faithful and you keep working in my heart to give me confidence that you will continue to be faithful. And then, every time this week, God, please let it be so. When you put your shoes on, matter of fact, why don't you go get a new pair? Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody like, thank you, Jesus, <laughs> right? Because you have a shoe fetish. I want you to get some shoes, and when you put them on, I want you to be reminded of the peace that God gives us. Not something we try and manufacture ourselves, but peace that is birthed out of a complete embrace of the message of the gospel that changes us because we know truth. Our heart remains protected with his righteousness, not ours, and we remain stable and agile because we have peace that blows our mind and we stand prepared and ready to fight with the shield of his faithfulness guarding us. Listen, did Paul know what he was talking about? Paul loved his church. Paul wanted his church to stand fully protected because he knew the enemy was coming. 
please hear my heart today. I love our church. That's you. And I know the enemy this week will come after you. I want you to stand strong against his attacks. I want you to be ready to fight. So we make a decision together. As we learn about these things, we don't just know it here. We put this stuff into practice in our lives. So this week, you and I are going to make a decision to fight different, and we're going to gear up. Can I tell you something? I am very excited about next week. It's going to be good. I might even wear my red shoes again. <laughs> Will you bow your head for just a moment? You see, there might be someone that's here today that hasn't made a decision to accept the Lord as their personal Savior, and you've been fighting alone, and the enemy's taking you. You're tired, you're beat up. You've been trying to overcome on your own, and it's not working. But today you're understanding the battle differently, and you're understanding there, there's a target on you, but you were never meant to fight unprepared and by yourself. You see, when you say yes to the Lord, we fight differently. Oh, he loves you. That's why he came and died for you. And today he gives each of us an opportunity to say yes to him. And if you're here today and you've never said yes to the Lord, I want to give you a chance to do that right now. It would be my honor to pray with you so that from this moment on, you can live different, geared up and prepared. Everybody's heads bowed and eyes that are closed. I'm going to start over here on my right. If you would say, Doug, you know what? You've been speaking to me today. I'm whooped. And I want it to look different. I want to fight with his help. And I'm going to stop doing this on my own. I want that gospel message that you've talked about to change me. If that's you over here on my right, your left, would you just raise your hand so I know who I'm praying with? I see you in the back there. Yep, yep. Both of you can put your hands down. Anyone else? Yep, over here on my right. You can put them down. How about here in the middle? Anybody here in the middle? Yep. I got you. You can put them down. How about over here on my left? You're right. Anybody? Yeah, I see you. Awesome. Lots of hands today. <laughs> Father, you've seen those that have raised their hands. If you did, will you just pray with me? God, I need you. I'm done with the battle being fought by myself. I choose today to say yes to the good news, to the gospel, and I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I thank you that you died on the cross for me, and today I ask you for forgiveness. And I pray now that as I begin this journey of faith that you would help me to understand what it means to fight with your help. I don't want to do this alone any longer. Help me to understand your power at work in me. Help me to understand what it looks like to fight with your armor, not mine. And Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus for all the rest of us that are here that maybe have made this decision a long time ago, but we've been fighting again on our own. Will you help us this week to gear up and to fight smart? The belt of truth, the body armor of your righteousness, shoes that help us to experience and stand confidently in your peace and a shield, a shield that will protect us because you have been and you will be faithful. It's in your name we pray. Amen.